Come on, uh, I don't know, do you love Jesus today? How's it going? What's, what's going on? What's going on? Um, we love you all. It's, uh, it's been a good summer. We're headed into fall and we're gonna have a great year, great year ahead of us. Just as I begin uh, this morning, will you please welcome pastors Doug and Annette Walker, wherever you are, can you please stand? They're just friends of ours from right over here in their family uh, from Austin, Texas. We love you guys. Um, originally from Colorado, and uh, I just found out this morning, I didn't know this, I found out this morning that they actually got married in this church on this platform about 900 years ago, I heard something like that. That's why I call you Moses, but, um, but yeah, they walk, he said, we walked right down this aisle and, and got married on this platform, and uh, it's just good to see you, glad you could be here and check out what's going on. Um, I think that, uh, that uh, this next series is gonna be good, Tessa, we're good. We're good. Can you just thank Tessa? Thanks. Bye. Love you. Um, so today, today we're going to start a new series on the family. And uh, um, I, what I have felt in my spirit all summer as I prayed about the fall is before we get to Heart for the House in October, that there's a few things that we just want to really talk about and address uh, right now during this season. And I think that coming out of the pandemic, um, watching families and seeing where the world is at and all the different discussions that are in the media and the news, what I felt was in my heart was I felt like, no, we need to really d dig in, dive in to what family is. How many of you think that's a, that's a good idea? Should we do that for a few weeks? That's going to be good. It's gonna be good. Now, one of the things that you realize is that when you talk about the family and you try to go at it theologically, so my, my take on family in this series is gonna be purely theological in the sense that I wanna know exactly what the Bible says about certain subjects in family. The problem is, if, if you consider it a problem, I, I don't, but the problem is, is that the Bible says things a lot more uh, a lot more strongly than we do, right? So when you're reading scripture, the, the scriptures actually say things a lot more powerfully than we even say them when we preach. And so some of what I say this morning, I think we're gonna have a lot of fun in the series. I think that there's gonna be, uh, I'm gonna say some things, we're gonna, we're gonna have to adjust even how we view what family is a little bit, but that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna start that series, we're gonna go at it from the Bible, and we're gonna, we're gonna believe God that he does something and touches our lives and our families. Now, when I was growing up as a kid, there was a phrase that I've thrown around a little bit in church, a couple of sermons, I've mentioned it. Uh, if you're friends or family with us, you've heard me use this phrase. And it's a phrase that represents family. So when I was a kid, um, I was in Hawaii and my family, um, so Islanders, Islanders are their own breed of people. I'm just telling you right now, like don't get, in the way of a pork shop at a family reunion. You know what I mean? It's like family, family, is, um, family is a very important part of the Hawaiian, the Asian culture, as it is with all of us. But we have a phrase, and that phrase is calabash. Now, I've mentioned calabash before, but here, here's the thing. So the calabash is a, um, the calabash is a, it's like a gourd or a melon, and, and they use it all over the world, especially in cultures that are tropical in nature. And the calabash, is this gourd, and the outside of the gourd is so hard, it's like, it's like wood. And after you dry it, it's like the hardest thing you've ever seen. So in some cultures, they use it uh, to uh, fill with water, they use it to carry water, in, like in canteens. Uh, in some cultures, they, they, uh, they use it for different kind of building material. Some cultures, like in Hawaiian culture and Asian culture, the calabash is actually a melon, you cut it in half, you dry it out, and you put it in the middle of the, of the dinner table. And when you put this in the middle of the dinner table, sometimes it's got food in it, sometimes it's decor, but the idea is that anyone who comes to the table is family. Anyone who has a meal together is family, your calabash. So calabash means family but not family, and many of you have friends like that. Um, and in our culture, you know, most of you would know the word like ohana, you know, if you watched Moana, it's like ohana means Family, but calabash is different. Calabash is, is more of a, a slang term that means anyone who's like family. 
And it's a really big deal in Hawaii because in Hawaii, everybody is confused on who's family and who's not family because everybody is your auntie or your uncle. Like there's no, like, you don't know, like growing up as a kid, this is not an exaggeration. I don't think until I was in my early 20s, now keep in mind I came from a broken family. I didn't know the island side of my family, the Hawaiian, the Filipino side, I didn't know them, but everybody was uncle. So people would mention like, I thought I literally had like five or 10 uncles. Because we'd be in we'd conference, oh yeah, your uncle, you know, your uncle, you know, Uncle Chemo, Uncle Thor. That's another thing. Like, why do Islanders always pick names? Like, what's your name? Thor. It's all good. Be whatever you want, bro. You know, Uncle Chemo, Uncle Keanu, Uncle, Uncle, uh, you know, all these uncles. I thought I had like five uncles and five aunties. And then I realized I actually didn't. But there was something about people who lived together and ate together and came over to your house. They were considered calabash, so they were family. And so there's a little bit of a, uh, of a tension, like who's my uncle and who's, who's my, not my uncle, because everybody is family. Now, this, this, uh, this centerpiece of the table, when I was growing up as a kid, there were all kinds of people around my table. I've been around a lot of tables. I've been around a lot of tables. Sometimes I'm invited to the table, Sometimes in my life, uh, we've hosted the table. I can't remember any time in my life, even growing up as a kid, through some of the harder parts of our family season, I can't remember ever a time where there wasn't someone eating with us that needed food. And even though we didn't have a lot of money, my mom was always feeding my friends and feeding the people that were like a little harder off than, than we were. Uh, family for us around the table has always been has always been blood relatives, and it's always been like a, a family friend who came over. Maybe it's someone who a single person in college who didn't have their family there, and they got to come over and have a meal. And and believe it or not, there were even times in our life where I've shown up to a meal at home or with a family, and there's a total stranger there. And it's kind of funny because in so, most cases you'd be like, "So who are you?" Sometimes I don't even notice. I just fist bump and like, "Let's pray. Let's go." Like, I don't even know who you are, but someone invited somebody to the table. That spirit is the Calabash spirit. It's like family, but you're not family, and, and I grew up with that. Now, that example is actually the closest thing theologically to family that we have in the Bible. In the Bible, there's something in Scripture that teaches us that family is more than just those people who are blood relatives to you. And what I'm gonna do this morning is we're gonna get into it and I'm gonna make a little adjustment to how we view it theologically because theologically, family is anyone who is in the house of God. And even the word house in the Bible is, is not just related to people who are blood relatives, but it's actually anyone in your household, even the household was other people. It was people who served the family, people who you were friends with. And so we're gonna talk about it this morning and I'm gonna do a message called The Theology of of family, all right? So let's pray. Father, I thank you for today and I thank you for the church family. I pray, Lord, that you would bless our house, that you'd bless this place. I pray, Jesus, that you would bless every home, every individual, every family, every couple. I thank you, Father, for the goodness and the grace of God. And today, Father, we just come to you and we say, we belong to you. We love your, your grace and your forgiveness in our lives. You're everything to us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would guide us and lead us as we learn about family. And I thank you, Jesus, that there is a grace on this house and in this season to build deep, meaningful relationships. And so today, we also pray for every church in the Denver metro area. We pray that you bless them, that you'd strengthen them, every pastor, every person that's greeting, loving people, and singing a song. We pray you bless them today in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Okay, so... As we talk about the theology of family, everyone has a different family experience. Everybody does. Some people's uh, family experience, my personal family experience was a, little, was a little rough and we had some struggles, but everybody has a different family experience and that's why when we talk about what is family, you can't base family on what your experience is. Family in scripture has nothing to do with what our personal experience is. Our personal experiences are supposed to come under what the Bible says that, that family is. And so the tendency that we have is to define family according to what we've been through. So all people like, hey, what do you think about family? Like, oh, my family was this, or we had a rough time, so I actually don't want a family. And I've had people say to me, I wanna be a parent, you know, but I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna get married, or, or I, I wanna have a family, but, but I don't ever wanna see my family. And people have different kinds of experiences, 
but the tendency is to define family according to what you've been through, right? But before you had a family, there was a blueprint for family. So before family ever existed, before the creation of man, there was already a family that existed and that family had a blueprint and scripture refers to that blueprint as a house. Paul talks about it, it's in Corinthians, it's in Ephesians, it's in the Old Testament. So number one, before there was a family, there was a house. Before there was a family, there was a house. And um, you know, Paul talks about it, you know, um, in several places in scripture. But for you guys, I don't know if you, wherever you live, if you live in a house, you live in a condo, an apartment, wherever you live, while you're living in your place of residence, you may or may not have ever seen the blueprints that actually were designed to build your house. Now you may have, but you may not have understood them. I remember when our house was being built years and years ago, I was shown the blueprints, but they didn't mean a lot to me because I didn't understand them. There's actually a lot that goes into blueprints. It takes several kinds of engineers to put all of this thing together to call a house. So even though I may not understand the blueprints, I know that there's blueprints to put the house together. But what I do know is I know family. I know what happens inside the house. I know, I remember the laughter inside of our house. I remember the conflict in our house. I remember all the meals we had. I remember all the games that you play. You remember the games that you play as a family. And when you play games as a family, that's when you discover whether or not you know Jesus. Because some of you, when you're playing family games, salvation is not even an issue. You're there to lie, cheat, steal, kill, destroy. You know what I mean? It's like you remember the conflict. You remember the tears that you had. You remember the good times and the bad times all inside of this house that is actually was designed with a set of blueprints that cause you to feel safety inside of your home. What happens is, is that God's blueprint for the house that he's building, we're meant to go through all of those experiences inside of that blueprint, inside of that house. So that whenever we have an experience inside the house, it is covered and protected by the house, by the blueprint itself. We actually live inside of a house that was designed to give us shelter in the storms, to help us to protect us from the enemy. The doors are locked from those that want to hurt us. We come together, we eat, we laugh, we cry, we play games inside of this house. We were designed to live inside of this house, and this house is called theology. There is a theology of the family. And what happens is, is that whenever we begin to base what family is on our experiences, we start to step outside of the house. When you step outside of the house and you begin to think, okay, you know what? I'm going to respond according to how I feel. And so we're no longer defining family by the theology that covers us and protects us we're now stepping out from the house because we are offended or we're hurt or we're wounded. And so we step outside of the house, then all of a sudden we're gonna, we're gonna handle forgiveness the way that we think it should be handled. We're gonna define family the way we wanna define it. We're gonna define marriage the way that we think it should be defined. We're gonna parent the way that I read in some book by somebody who doesn't believe in God and has all these strategies and methods. And as we step outside of the house, we begin to drift away from the theology of the house and we begin to apply secular methods to how it is that we live. And then what happens is, the longer that we stay outside of the house, outside of the blueprint, and we begin to lead our families according to something that's not, it wasn't designed to do, be, or respond to, we begin to build something called a stronghold. A stronghold is a way of thinking that is not the way that God thinks. That's what a stronghold is. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we read that there are strongholds. What does it say a stronghold is? It is a thought, it is a way of thinking, it is a pretension, it is knowledge that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. And so a stronghold is not something that we as intercessors get in and pray and tear it down. A stronghold means that you have gotten so ingrained in how you think that you no longer think the way that the house was designed and now you are exposed to anybody who wants to manipulate you, tell you how it's supposed to be, live your way, life the way you want to live it and all of a sudden you can't figure out why am I going through so many things? Why does the enemy have such a stronghold in my life? It's because you have taken yourself out of the theology of what family is and you've removed yourself from from the house, okay? 
So now a word about theology. Theology is a big word, okay? Theology is two words together. It's theo, which means God, and logos, which means knowledge. So theology is logos, log, uh, theo, which means God, logos, that means knowledge. So when you put them together, you get theology. And theologians and people hear the word theology, academics look at theology and they say, okay, I'm making observations. We say theology is the study of God. The problem is, is that God is not on display for us to study. So God's up here and we're like, oh, I'm studying God. I'm checking him out. I'm walking around him in the museum. And I'm, you know, his, his ways aren't modern enough for me. I, don't, I, I think that's a good traditional thought from 50 years ago, but it doesn't apply to me today. And we begin, theology makes, makes observations about God. We had, we had a great vacation this last year, this last summer, and we got to go as a family to a museum. Now, I gotta be honest. I didn't realize how much of like museum heads my kids were because we had already walked a lot on our vacation and we went to this museum and I was thinking three hours were gonna be good and that includes lunch. <laughs> we get into the museum, we, start, we were there when it opened at 10, we didn't leave until 5.30 when it closed and I had, I had done all my steps, <laughs> right? But we loved it. There were mummies in there. I mean, there was things in there that were so cool and the more you watch it, the more you observe it, it's so incredible. I found myself at one time in one display walking around the display like 15 times and looking at things at a different angle because it was cool. It, was, it were things that were actually used in the time of Jesus. Like things that people in Jerusalem used and when Jesus was walking the earth. And so while you're watching it, you're making observations. The problem with theology is that if we become too academic about it, we think that God is just on display for us to observe, but that's not what theology means. I think the best definition of theology is thinking about God. So what I mean is this, is that God's not on display for us. Theology is the act of learning what God thinks about what I think. It's not, it's not observing God, it's learning about God's knowledge and what he thinks about what I think. And if what I think doesn't come under submission to what he thinks, then I am now out of the house and I'm building according to a knowledge that was never a part of the blueprint. So my life, my family, my relationships, it doesn't matter if I'm single, married, if you're a friend, if you're a coworker, it doesn't matter. All, every relationship that we have has to happen inside of the thoughts of God that we call the house of God, not the house, but the home, the house of God. You know, Paul talks about it, I've mentioned Paul, but in 2 Corinthians 5.8, Paul says this, yes, we have to have good courage for what we're going through today. Like, we need courage. Like, this is a mess, we need the courage. But then Paul says this, and we would rather be away from our body and at home with the Lord. So Paul, all the way through scripture, he recognizes that there is a theological home that came from heaven, and it was there before we, we ever existed. So we just need to remember that family is not an experience, it's a theology. It's a house. So before there was a family, there was a house. Number two, before there was a you, there was an us. Before there was a you, there was an us. Now Genesis chapter one, verse 26. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go all the way back to the beginning and we're gonna look at the very first reference to people being together and sharing something. In Genesis chapter one, verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. So before Adam and Eve were ever created, before there was ever a marriage, before there were ever people on the planet, there was something in heaven happening amongst the Godhead and the Godhead actually existed before you and I did. And when we think of family in the world that we live in, we tend to think of mom and dad and children. The problem is that the very first thing that has to do with relationships that came down out of heaven was not marriage, it was community. Because in heaven there was community before there was humanity and before there was marriage, humanity came before marriage. Marriage was actually the last piece. Then God said, let us 
make mankind. And by the way, mankind, that's not the word man. And we'll get into that next week when we talk about marriage. There's not, let's make man in our image. No, it's mankind. It's all of mankind in our image and in our likeness. And this is where the tension is because we tend to define family according to the culture that we live in. Now, theologians have come to the idea, the understanding that there is no perfect family. And there is no family that, like if you open up the Bible and you look at family, it goes back to Genesis and it says the very first family was Adam and Eve. doesn't say that. And that God breathed life into Adam and Eve at the same time God created a mankind. He didn't carry a, you know, a married couple. God breathes on the earth and the dust kind of goes like this. And out of the dust comes a man and a woman holding hands with a ring on the finger. You know what I mean? And then there, well, he's in a tux and she's in a white dress and Donna Lassa's playing the violin behind them and they come up out of the ground and God said, let us make a married couple. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it, it's not what happened. What happened was is that there was community between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The first thing that comes down to earth in our finite understanding is community. Let us make them in our image and in our image and in our likeness he created, they created them. And so there's community. And this tension, this tension has found its way all the way through the days of Jesus and found its way here because how we define family is really, really important because the original picture of family it's not a marriage, it's a table where people come together. Even in the, the days of Jesus, you know, remember in the days of Jesus, people forget this. People thought that when Jesus came, that he was trying to tear the family apart. People didn't understand it. People thought he was trying to destroy the family. He's trying to destroy the family, the Hebrew context, the where they lived. Jesus is here to destroy the family. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus says, if you don't hate your mother and father and hate your brother and sister and follow after me, you can't even be my disciple. So can you imagine if someone's walking around preaching, you gotta hate your family to be my disciple? People didn't understand it. And even today, the tension in that verse is tangible when you talk about family. What did Jesus mean? Jesus was not deconstructing the family. Jesus was humanizing every relationship. Because a relationship that cannot be humanized cannot be redeemed. And when you look at family, there is no perfect family, there's no perfect marriage, there's no perfect relationship, no one has walked this life perfectly, you love everybody, you hug everybody, you've never been frustrated, you've never been angry, you've never been upset, and everything is perfect. When I come to your home, it's like, leave it to Beaver, they're singing, everybody looks the same. Oh, wait for next week. Mom's in the kitchen, apron, cooking. Dad gets home just in time for the meal because the wife knew that he would be hungry and I'm here to be your helpmate. And we have these tensions because the word helper in scripture doesn't mean helpmate. It means the man couldn't do it by himself. So God sent him somebody who can get the job done. Now, I don't mean to be flippant, but that is the Hebrew and we'll talk about it next week. That's what the Hebrew says. And so before, before there was a family, there was a community, and the community came down. And everything that we do in life has to be humanized in the sense that if we won't humanize it and admit that we're a mess, then God can't redeem it. But if we're living outside of the theological house of family, we think that we're right. We think we know what to do. We think we're doing it the right way, but we've adopted the way of the world and the culture to handle all of our relationships and then we begin to see intimacy the wrong way. Well, I, I want to be intimate, but I don't want to be married. Or I want to be a parent, but I don't want to have a spouse. I, or I want to have friends, but I, I don't want to have to make any commitments. And, and all of a sudden, we realize, no, all of our relationships have to be humanized so that we can, then, we can then bring redemption in them. And everything that God does is driven by redemption. Theologically, there's a thing called redemptive theology, which means everything that God does is redemptive in nature. So it doesn't matter what has happened inside of the house. If you do it inside of the house, no matter what happens in the house, then all of a sudden you can redeem it. But if it happens outside of the house, you can't redeem it. 
because people don't want to be redeemed. Because they think that theology in scripture was meant for them to prove their point of what they believed of what happened inside of the house and they used the wrong scripture to address the wrong problem. So instead of, instead of using scripture to evaluate their heart, they use scripture as ammunition against the person that they're angry with. This is all what happens when you're inside or outside of the house. So when we think of family, the goal of the church is not to teach on what the perfect family is is, but it's how to be a better Christian in the family that you have. That's the goal. Our goal is to, is to teach on how to be better Christians in the family context that we have. It's not to tell you what the perfect Christian family is. Man, when I first got saved, I'm telling you, I believed this with all of my heart. I remember I got saved, I had been homeless for a while, I'd been a, an alcoholic. You know, I remember being drunk and disorderly and taking out all my issues on alcohol. And I remember the last day I took a drink at the age of 23. But I remember walking into church thinking all of these people must be perfect. Because that's what you think when you look at the church. You get into the church like everybody's perfect. You know, it's like a totally normal world, but everybody's wearing a tie. I don't have a tie. A perfectly normal world, but everybody knows the Bible. I don't know the Bible. And I see, and I saw moms and dads and brothers and sisters, and I watched them all show up in their minivans, and I thought, that just looks like purgatory. <laughs> like a minivan trapped in your family for 40 minutes in a, in a minivan. Like, how did you survive? Because we wouldn't have survived. You look at, you look at there's, there's no perfect family. And probably the greatest struggle that I had as a young believer was comparing who I was with who I thought the church was because I thought if I didn't have a family like that, that I wasn't as good as them and Jesus would see me as less. I'm damaged goods. But the Bible says, moms and dads and brothers and sisters and friends, we are all damaged goods in need of the grace of Jesus. My first family... I had no dad, hadn't, hadn't restored relationship with my mom. My sister was homeless in the street in the city. My first family was my small group. My small group was amazing. I didn't know what a small group was. But they invited me over and we hung out. We ate together. We, we took trips together. We hiked together. You know, and then over time, this, this group of friends, I remember one time my truck, my truck broke down and I called someone in my small group and they came over and fixed my truck because I can't fix anything. It's still, it's a thing, I can't do it. You know, I remember I was dating, thinking about dating this girl who wasn't doing well with Jesus. And I, that's when I heard the term missionary dating. Do you know that? Missionary dating? I'll date them and get them saved. You know what I mean? I was being, I was being MD, do you know what I'm saying? One of the girls in my, in our, in my small group came up to me and she says, I'm gonna tell you something right now. She does not have your best interest in mind. And you barely know Jesus, you don't need to be getting to know her. So let's get our act together, let's get yourself back in church, and let's find out how you're supposed to treat a woman, because you don't know how to treat a woman. I was like, like, what do you do? But when God's working, you go, okay, I'm sorry, okay. You know? My, my small group, one time I was ready to leave Jesus. I was so discouraged and so depressed and so overwhelmed at my sin and my situation. I remember the, the night I went to the last small group. I walked in and, and here I am sitting there in the bedroom by myself thinking, how am I gonna leave? Because I'm, I'm doing so bad, I'm struggling so bad. You know, everybody else is so perfect and everybody went to Bible college and everybody comes from a Christian family. And everyone has a call of God in their life and I sit in there and I'm like, you wanna talk about drugs? Let's talk about drugs, you know? I have nothing to say, nothing. I was so discouraged, I'd made so many mistakes. I was sitting on the bed in this guy's apartment watching TV because I don't want to go out and face my small group. And then somebody comes walking in, his name was Don Marshall, and Don Marshall had a bag of Taco Bell. And trust me, when you're in your early 20s, that's like manna from heaven. You know what I'm saying, college people? That's a manna. He walks in with Taco Bell, sits down on the bed, and he says, hey, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. He goes, listen, 
I was, I was on my way to a small group tonight, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said to come find you here because the Lord told me that you were thinking about leaving and leaving church and going away because you're discouraged. So I went and got you some food, and I'm sitting on the bed with you, and I just want you to know you can make it. You're going to do this. You're going to get through this. That, that young man, Don Marshall, changed the course of my life. Do you know why? Because he brought me to the calabash. He brought me to the table. Yeah, that calabash just happened to be Taco Bell. <laughs> you get the point. There's no perfect family, but, per- but family is also not just married people who have children in a perfect world. This is, this is theology. So before there was you, number three, there was also a me. Before there was a Donna, there was a Doug. Before there was a Doug, there was a Donna. I'm an individual before Christ. Before marriage, there was just me and my community, the house. Learning about God, learning about myself, pressing into Jesus. Genesis chapter one, verse 26, let us make man in our image, right? But then you get down to to, uh, chapter two, verse 18, and it says, for it is not good for man to be alone. But what it does not say, it does not say it is not good for man to be single. It does not say that. There is a doctrine of aloneness before there is a doctrine of marriage. Because when I go to heaven, I don't stand before my savior with my wife. Can you imagine if you went to heaven as a couple, one of you would be late. I'm not saying which one, I'm just saying one of you be oh, sorry about that. <sighs> Um, there's a doctrine of aloneness before there's a doctrine of marriage. Because God, the key to a good marriage is not finding a wife. The key to a good marriage is having a great relationship with Jesus. See, Jesus can't, Jesus can do what your wife or your husband cannot do. You cannot change your spouse. It's not your job to shape the character of your spouse or to tell your spouse how they're supposed to live. That's not how it works. It works by us as individuals pressing into Jesus. Before there was marriage doctrine, there was the doctrine of aloneness, which means that I have to be here before my Savior by myself, but God said, but it's also not good for you to be alone. So alone exists, but it's not bad. But he also says as a reflection of heaven that we also need to have a community. So first, it is a doctrine of aloneness. Then it is a doctrine of community. And third, it is a doctrine of marriage. It's the community. I mean, I'd love to say that, that my wife you know, changed me. And it's like my savior and I, I'd love to say that over the years, you know, and I am glad because she's incredible and, and we have a good marriage, but the truth is it was me standing before Jesus, working things out, and then, then finding a community, a small community of people who would walk with me and support me and help me and give me advice and talk to me. It was alone and then it was together, and this is the pattern, the theological pattern of Jesus, of God. Let us... Make them in our image and in our image and our likeness. He, we created them. And in them, I first stand before Jesus, but then God says, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna give you a community. That community in this case was Eve, which would begin the journey of family, but it's like we have a community and I'm here and we're building and now we're growing together and you realize that if you don't get the alone part right, you won't get the marriage part right. I know a lot of people who are married and still feel alone. I've had people, I've had, I've had married people sit in my office for counseling. And they're like, I've been married for 15 years, but I feel like, I still feel like I'm single. I feel just as lonely as I did before. And I've had single people come in and say, I'm totally miserable because I can't find a spouse. This is the recipe to never understand how God works theologically in family. Because we're all family Because God first works from heaven to the individual, then he replicates heaven in community, and then the rest comes. There's a great uh, quote from a guy, his name's Rodney Stark. I just read his book uh, about a year and a half ago because he talks about the first century 
pandemic and how the church responded. And it's, it's a beautiful picture of how the church, the church when, when everyone else was hiding, the church ran into the street to minister to people. It's a beautiful book. Uh, Rodney Stark, Stark wrote this. He said, um, to cities filled with newcomers and strangers, Christianity offered an immediate base, basis for attachment. To cities filled with orphans and widows, Christianity provided a new and expanded sense of family. And to cities that were torn apart by a violent ethnic strife, Christianity offered a new basis for brotherhood and solidarity. There's something about community. There's something about standing before Jesus by yourself, but realizing that he did give us each other to help us on the walk. You realize that marriage is an opportunity, but it's not a requirement. The requirement is that we understand the first two pieces. You know, I don't mean to be, like, I'm not trying to, I don't want to push this too much, but like, we're about to do small groups here in the next month or two. My encouragement to you would be to test this theory. That as the church lays out our small group plan, jump into a small group. See how God can begin to work in your heart as you build solidarity and brotherhood and friendship. So there is no perfect family. Before there was, before there was anything, there was a house. And before there was uh, before there was you, there was an us in heaven. And before there was an us, there was a me. For those of you, there's a me. And God wants us to understand that theologically, this is family. And that's where it began. Now, the rest of it, we're gonna talk about because it's important. Next week, we're gonna talk about marriage. The week after, we're gonna talk about being single. And then the week after that, we're gonna talk about parenting, okay? And I think it's gonna be a great series. But let's all stand together and let's wrap this up. Let me pray for you. And as you're standing, can you please just maybe clap your hands and tell Jesus that we applaud his house. Come on, we applaud his house. We applaud how it was designed. Bow your heads with me. Bow your heads with me.